Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension here in Hernando County. And joining me today is my regular co-host, Lily Browning, who is the Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator here in Hernando County. So good morning, Lily. How are you? I'm just super, Bill. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing very well. A little tired, and apparently you're a little tired and feeling a little under the weather also. Yes, but don't worry. It's not what everyone might fear it would be. <laughs> I took two tests. <laughs> it's not that. So. Well, I'm happy to hear that you passed your tests with flying yeah. colors. That's always good. You always want to pass those kind of tests. Mm -hmm. So, wow, it's really gray and dreary and at least not drizzly outside of my window here at work. Mm. No, we do need some rain. Yeah, we do. We got some, what, a week or two ago? It poured, but just once just mm -hmm. enough to make my grass green and grow a little bit and now mm -hmm. it's dried out again so yes my husband just got a new riding mower and oh. he keeps wanting to go out and mow just to use the mower <laughs> the grass doesn't need it well you have to figure out the controls and practice the turns yes, and, you know and, you know he got it he got a good deal on it because it's the off season yeah, yeah, now is a good time of year. If you can find a lot of those things to buy them, I know all the stores have been filled with all the Christmas stuff for a while. Oh, yeah. Since, but you yeah, know what comes yeah. right after Christmas and they get rid of all that Christmas stuff? Valentine's Day? <laughs> no, no, no. This is all the spring gardening stuff. Yes. So the big box stores, they bring in all the seeds and the plants and the tools and equipment and seed trays and everything else. Yep. I think it's um, high allergy season, <laughs> too. I think that is mainly yeah. what my issue is. Well, I know right now about the only thing out wild that you have blooming a lot is salt bush, and I don't know if that's a problem for anybody. No, but I'm wondering, um, as I was just telling you before we went live, Something, the only different thing I've done recently is I was helping cleaning up a parking lot um, um, that had a lot of oak leaves, you know, had been landing there for a long time. It was an area hadn't been used in a while and I was shoveling it up. Those leaves were composting beautifully <laughs> into the uh, asphalt, um, but shoveling up the the bottom was compost, the top was oak leaves, a whole bunch of that, and then like flinging it into a ditch. So I'm wondering if I released something that uh, took seed inside my head here. <laughs> so You can. There's because composting leaves or composting grass clippings or pine needles or whatever, uh, you're going to have a lot of fungi in there helping to break it down. It's all fungi and bacteria that turn a pile of leaves into a pile of compost eventually. And the fungi can get white and very powdery. And when you start disturbing it and shoveling it or raking it or moving it around, it'll all kind of blow up in the air. And that can cause some people problems. I know out west they have fungi that just rest naturally in the soil. And they have a lot of wind out west and wind storms. And it doesn't happen to many people, but some people will breathe it in and the fungi will actually hatch in their lungs and it makes them extremely sick. It kills maybe one or two people a year out west. <laughs> Not over here. Great, Bill. No, no, no. It's out west. <laughs> Along with the murder hornets. Guys, we don't have murder hornets in Florida. They're out in Washington state. And that <laughs> fungi is in California and probably some surrounding states out there. And we don't want to discourage people from composting at all. I think if you throw it in one of our bins and um, just aerate it from time to time, that's mm -hmm. not the same thing that I was doing, a whole lot of shoveling and flinging of the material. So. 
and you may just have a cold or a seasonal kind of thing, or maybe you're allergic to the blooming salt bush. You have a lot of it around my house that I hadn't, you know, who knows? <laughs> Never reacted that way before to that. Yeah, you see a lot of that in roadside ditches and the fields out near the Master Gardener Nursery. There's a whole bunch of it out there. So a whole bunch of really pretty um, changing fall color Caesar weed at your um, nursery. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> hey, I was at the Master Gardener Nursery on Saturday. Maybe they have something that got me. <laughs> <laughs> that could be. Uh, so if you like, if you're interested in buying any plants from our nursery, or you'd like to come out there and see the blooming salt bush in the fields and ditches nearby, or if you'd like to come out there and have a look at some invasive plants, because we have plenty <laughs> growing wild on that piece of property out around the edges, they're really tough to control. Uh, there's the address for our master garden and nursery. They are open Wednesdays and Saturdays, 8.30 in the morning until noon. And I did pick up some beautiful gill pond hollies there. And you were there giving away blackberries. No, distributing blackberries. Yes. Yes, I was them giving them out free. We were distributing <laughs> them to our class participants. And boy, were you. I came near you when you barked at me. You weren't in the class. Get away from my blackberries. <laughs> And let's see, Nancy says Lowe still has seeds. Yeah, I mean, they have if some get, around. If you, can, if you can get to the Brooksville Lowe's, good luck. You just can come in from behind it. Yeah, That's it's tucked awesome. in the corner behind all the Christmas trees and the massive blow-up Santas that you put in your front yard and everything else. You know, the road is um, 41 in Wisconsin. You probably know that. Trying to get to the nursery is messed up, blocked off. Okay, yeah, back to breathing in fungi. Well, at least it's hopefully it's not lung mushrooms. It might be a good time to show that I'm related to a mushroom, Bill. <laughs> oh, yeah, if you want me to show that. Um, and you're going to have to explain this one. I, <laughs> I'm going to let you explain it. I'm related to a beautiful mushroom. <laughs> Um, apparently, and neither Bill nor I knew what a angel destroying mushroom was, but if you Google it, it's and just any number, it's a common name for any number of white um, poisonous mushrooms. My granddaughter here goes to a very fun school where their theme of the quarter is wild things, and she was assigned to come to school as a white, as an angel destroying mushroom, but also in formal attire. <laughs> so here you go, my beautiful angel destroying <laughs> mushroom. Yes, yeah, she makes she makes a great looking mushroom there, Lily. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you should be proud. And I haven't been around her in that outfit, so I don't think she, I'm allergic to her. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm not sure what the play is going to be about, but it's not a play. It's just how they they're very um, interactive learning. <laughs> so. That's that's pretty interactive. Yes. <laughs> okay, come to school dressed as your favorite fungi. How's yeah, that? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and we both learned what. Um, Angel destroying mushrooms are. I've never heard of them. Yeah, but you know, so, so many different things have they're common names. White. Right. So they're white and they're poisonous. Hence, somebody names them in the mycology world. Yeah. Name is that. So. Well, I know the white fairy ring mushrooms. That's a really common, common name. Mm -hmm. And they're very common growing in people's yards. Mm -hmm. They tend yeah. to, the fungus grows underground and grows in a big circle. So around the edge of the circle, it sends up mushrooms. So now you have mushrooms in your yard that looks kind of like a circle. You know, it's usually yeah, not a perfect it. circle, but pretty close. I've seen it. If it's enough room, it'll make a perfect circle. Yeah. 
Yeah, my neighbor gets them quite often. I don't. Um, not the full circle. He waters. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> so you know. That can you have uh, you have to have organic matter in the soil, and just the right moisture. And when the mushroom is in the mood, it'll when the fungus is in the mood, it'll make mushrooms. Right. I get mushrooms. I just don't get the full circle like he does. They're really pretty cool. I don't um, think I get any in my yard. Oh, Heather's asking you about, I guess she brought you the ants? Yes, she did. She brought me a beautiful jar of ants, not quite as big as my first jar, which is a very large jar of ants. Yeah, sorry, Heather, I haven't had a chance to um, shoot you an email, but you do have the invasive, tawny, crazy ants. Oh, no. I looked online, and the information that was given to me before has been put together in a fact sheet. So I'll go ahead and email that to you today. And it has a lot of really good information on baits, controls, sprays. But don't think that you have to depend totally on the sprays because I know that you have bees also. Baits uh, and attractants and things can work really, really well for ants. Aren't so they, um, all the different product names and things that you could do. Are they a sweet attracting type ant? I think they'll eat anything. Oh, okay. Oh, I, I think sugar ants and stuff. You get that taro baits or whatever. Yeah. Oh, no. You need to use different baits than that. And all those different things are generally available online. So a lot of the – sometimes we make recommendations, and it may be something – because – if you go to a big box store, they have such a limited selection and they have huge stacks and piles of seven, S-E-V-I-N, in every form imaginable, which I never have to recommend to anybody because it's really broad spectrum. It's going to kill everything. Uh, but all the specific things, they have so many great baits and things on the market. I had a problem a year or so ago with um, Australian roaches. The really really big ones that look like that people call palmetto bugs and i had some that got into the garage from the outside and i ordered some baits and it comes in a syringe it's kind of brown and goopy and i i got four syringes for a good price i only went through half a syringe and squirted little dabs back in the corners boom within three days they're all gone never come back totally I can fixed handle, i can handle Still. many 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 things but not roaches. <laughs> yeah, so if you, had, if you called your exterminator, he'll come back and spray every 30 days and keep coming back and spraying every 30 days. And after a certain point, I go, what are you using? It can't be very good if you have to keep coming back. Aren't you going to fix my problem? Yeah. So, so the and correct date and yeah. the correct thing, and they have a lot of great stuff on the market now that works really well. The safe. It's not spraying stuff in your dog's water bowl or around the kids or making anybody you know sick or injured and bees and kids and probably dogs and all that so yeah yeah so there are things that you can use on ants that are not going to hurt your bees or kids or anything else or the neighbors i see in these um neighborhood groups which <laughs> they're so fun to watch um <laughs> People come in to my neighborhood group and they say, okay, I've just moved here, so now who should I get for pest control? Just like it's a given, like, where do I buy a mailbox? You know, it's like, and because they're told, you move to Florida, you must immediately start pest control. Yeah. Do you have pest control at your house, Dr. Lynch? Oh, gosh, no. We had a guy, and it was probably 25 years ago, and I got rid of him. Well, the lady who came out and did it, she was really nice, but it was the every 30 days, walk through the house with the pump sprayer and spraying all the baseboards and then putting, and this was so long ago, Diazinon and Durasban was still on the market for homeowners. Mm -hmm. And she put the granules outside and I asked her, you know, what are you doing? I'm putting granules outside. Well, what's that supposed to do? Kill bugs. What bugs? bad bugs you know she wasn't really clear on what she was doing why she was doing it or how well it would work or not work i got rid of her and i've always encouraged a huge population of different lizards and beneficials oh, yeah. on the outside of the house to eat stuff before it gets in the house 
I have like other than um, an outbreak of sneaky palmetto bugs a year or so ago, I've not had any problems. We occasionally get ants that come in from outside through a little crack in the wall, and I got a spray, I got dust, boom, very quickly I solved the problem. I'm not going to treat the problem endlessly for, well, you got to spray every month for the rest of your life. Forget that. <laughs> now, you may be moving into a previously owned home mm -hmm. that may already have a problem, but once you get it under control, and your boss, Jim Davis, has a lot of really good ideas and ways how to do that. You don't need to continue it. We've lived, we bought our house new. We're the only people who have lived in it. But we've lived there going on 15 years. I mean, occasionally my husband has had to, you know, of course, take care of paper wasps or something maybe around the perimeter occasionally, you know, outside. Do we have scorpions? Yes. Do we have daddy, you know, daddy long leggers all over the place? Yeah. Do we have spiders? Sure. As long as it's not trying to get too close to me, I don't care. The spiders are going to eat those other bugs too. Yes, they do help with that. So. And yeah, you can't sanitize the great outdoors. And some people, it seems like they want to kill everything that's outside. It's like, you may want to think about getting a condo on the 13th floor where you don't have to deal with any living things. Because if you have a house, there's living things outside of it that you have to deal with. You can't kill them all. I've shocked Cindy with saying I have scorpions. If you live um, in a, uh, like a sandhill scrub like I do, um, Royal Highlands here in Hernando County, we do have Florida scorpions and i see a lot of talk about those a lot of chats out there on the neighborhood groups now if you step on it or come across it it'll sting you and hurt like a wasp luckily i haven't you know that hasn't happened to me sometimes if we leave shoes in the garage or something we fling them around <laughs> you know to make sure yeah. they put in there it's not like an arizona scorpion that is going to poison and kill you yeah, ours are small, and they do sting, and it does hurt from what I understand. I've never had it happen to me, but uh, unless you're severely allergic or have some other, kind, other underlying health problems, they generally are not fatal. It just hurts really bad. Yeah. My husband is more cognizant of them than I am, and so it's odd that I haven't been stung by them, but... You know, when he sees them, he um, he mechanically controls them, <laughs> and then that's that. So. Yeah, so if you're like Heather, she says she has bees, aquaponics, kids, dogs, and a cat, and chickens, and everything else. You need to be careful with what you're using. You obviously, if you have a pest problem, you need to look at it realistically, remembering that you can't, you know, you can't sanitize all the woods in Royal Highlands there, Lily. So, I mean, you can't keep your your house and everything safe, but you have to understand what your problem is and what's going to be effective for it. If you go out there and just start dousing the whole property with seven or malathion, you're probably going to cause more problems than what you're fixing. Sure. Because... You're killing everybody, so you're killing your allies off. And what generally happens is, well, first of all, you're not killing everyone. You know, the rule of Darwinism, who, who are you killing? You're killing the weakest ones. Mm -hmm. So the pest insects, by their very nature, are usually pretty invasive. So they overcome a lot. So you've killed off all the weak ones of them. You've created your own super race. Of pest insects that are the ones left to breed, and they always regenerate faster than your allies. That's why it's so much better to learn friend from foe if you don't know. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> if you don't know, send you a picture. Don't spray first and ask questions later. Find out what it is, if it's a problem and then how to appropriately deal with it. 
Yeah, because a lot of times we'll speak with somebody and they have a, a problem with their lawn or a tree or a plant and they spray first without figuring out, is it an insect, a disease, nutrient issue? And usually what they pick is not the right choice. I mean, you can roll the dice and hope you, you know, roll a seven or an 11 and hit it right on the first time, but most people don't. So what is going on lately? So Cindy, Cindy learned something about scorpions today. So, <laughs> so the show, this episode has been successful. <laughs> I have a kind of a different topic. What is the latest feel about Cuban tree frogs? I mean, should we dispose of them if we see them, or have they gone past that point of us even trying? You should always try to reduce and eliminate um, invasives like Cuban tree frog, frogs or plants or trees or whatever it might be we're not going to get rid of them. The best we could do is manage them. And a lot of um, dealing with invasives is just looking at management. They rarely talk of completely eliminating something unless there's just a small, like um, the giant African land snails. There were a lot of them, but they were concentrated in a very small area in Miami. And they were able to basically not wall it off, but just check everything that comes and goes agriculturally, and they were able to eradicate it, but that's rare. So Cuban tree frogs, as you encounter them, if you're sure it's a Cuban tree frog, a lot of information online how to tell the difference between them and native frogs, uh, you should put them in a bag and place them in your freezer overnight to dispatch of them humanely. Okay, well, here's the, the reality of it. Even speaking from me and i think i speak for a lot of people i don't have any yeah lead, lead us a lot to, I, <laughs> I don't have an inclination to want to touch a frog let alone kill a living thing <laughs> so well, you should always I'm, i mean whenever you're handling any toad or frog you should have on gloves or at least you know a plastic grocery store bag over your hand or something I shoot one out of my the door of my car the other day. It was in a hurry, and um, it was just much easier to make him hop away than to say, "Show me your pads," <laughs> and let me, you know, try and uh, dispose of you. So I guess I was bad, and that I'm just like, eh, "Go on your way." <laughs> well, I'm sure that apparently everybody doesn't like them, <laughs> but I mean. That happens, you know, if you dispatching of that one would not have had a huge impact on the broader problem. And I know the, um, none of us want to purposefully kill anything, but we got to also keep in mind that they are not only eating the food source of our native frogs, they're eating the native frogs. Yes, they are in the process of wiping them out or changing all the population dynamics. I have a friend who also doesn't wish to kill them, but she caught one and she would take them to another friend to dispose of them <laughs> humanely. But sometimes she drove around in her car so long, <laughs> it was already taken care of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so at least by freezing them, they just go night, night. <laughs> yes, they do. That is the, the humane way to take care of them. And on the other hand, I speak with some people who have not lived here in Florida for very long, and they flip out over every toad, frog, lizard, everything. They're out there with a shovel trying to sanitize the great outdoors, and it usually doesn't work well. And we do not encourage that. You are going to cause more problems than what you're what you think you're solving so let's say for example snakes because so many people are just petrified of snakes and they kill first get them id'd second and it usually turns out to be a black snake or something beneficial mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so if you kill all the snakes on your property i hope you like mice and rats because you're probably going to have more of them and you're probably going to have a population explosion 
of the frogs and toads and lizards because the snakes do eat some of them mm -hmm. and help keep them in balance. Snakes don't wipe out your lizards. You know, lizards don't wipe out the snakes. You know, they, they all keep each other in balance. But when you start throwing one part of it really out of whack, you end up with a lot of other unintended consequences, unintended problems. I find it fascinating the story you tell about lizards where the um, brown uh, exotic lizards have come to an agreement with our native green lizards and how they um, get along together. How does that work? Yes, the, those brown, brown anoles, and some people call them chameleons, but they're really not. They're the little brown lizards are invasive. They came here from Cuba many years ago, and they've taken over and pushed the native green anoles. They look the same, it's just the native green ones are green, and the other invasive ones are brown. Uh, they push them out, but the green ones will climb higher. So if you look in your backyard, you'll have green ones up in the trees above a certain height, and the brown ones running around the sidewalk, the bushes, down at ground level. And they're both present, and they both provide a lot of pest control. All they do is run around and eat bugs and make babies all day long. That's it. Mm -hmm. And you've been asked by people in a certain um, very, very, very large community in Central Florida uh, how to get rid of them. And I know it's difficult for you to uh, answer in a uh, professional tone at that point, was it? Yeah, I mean, get out. <laughs> get out. <laughs> why would, why you would, you, why would you Number one, why would you want to? Number two, why would you try? Number three, I don't give control recommendations for that. I've lived in Florida, you know, most of my life. It really does not enter my consciousness when I walk outside and lizards are, you know, scattering yep. around. Not you deal with it. Me. It's it's one of those living things that lives outside in your yard. If you can't deal with that, you may want to look at a condominium where you don't have an outdoors. I mean, you, you have a common area, you know, where you come and leave the building, but that's not your responsibility. That's not your issue. And that way you don't have to deal with lawns and bugs and snakes and birds and everything. And it all does work together. We may not want insects in our yard. Yeah. But without insects, you're not going to have birds. They're only going to come by to eat, <laughs> you, you know, or they may <coughs> they may have other purposes, but a food source needs to be nearby. You can't try to invite company over without feeding them. <laughs> there and, you go. And, you know, those insects that you want rid of well that's their food source and on the other hand sometimes they we get upset because our beautiful butterfly caterpillars become part of the food source circle well that is just the circle of life a butterfly will lay just thousands of eggs and you know with the hope that a few of them will actually become butterflies to keep up the cycle but some of them are destined to be a very digestible, nutrient-rich source, nutrient, yeah, rich source food for birds or other creatures too. Mm -hmm. And Nancy says she's got the the green anoles in her banana plant. Yeah, in most yards you're going to see both, and also I've always had over in Volusia County and in my yard here. I think it's the common name is a six-line skink. Mm -hmm. They tend to be a little bit longer, and they have the kind of bluish lines down their back. Yep. And they're That's they're very nice. pretty also, and they eat a lot of bugs. Yeah. Yep. But yeah, like Cindy says, um, there's other critters that we're told to kill, like bufo toads, which are a huge problem. They can be um, very toads toxic, do dangerous. Want to do pets. Yeah, because you may. Eat, I mean, a dog licks it, and it. It could die just that yeah. Lovers, lovers have never been a problem in my life. I've always had them in my yard, and I've never had them damage anything, but I don't have any bulbs or anything that they actually eat a lot of. 
So just because you have lovers hanging out in your yard doesn't necessarily mean you're experiencing a high level of damage from them. And then black widow spiders, you know, most spiders are pretty cryptic. And if they're out in your yard, I just leave them alone. I just leave them I mean, be. I'd be careful, like under chairs, if you see egg sacs and stuff, you want to mm -hmm. carefully get rid of those because you don't want one crawling up your leg or your <laughs> company's leg or anything. Yeah. And of course, inside your house, uh, paper wasps around the doorway in a spot where you might get hurt or older people or children or pets. Sure, that's a different situation. You have to to evaluate that and take whatever kind of steps you need to, but don't go searching long and wide out in your backyard looking for, oh my gosh, I caught a spider way back in the corner, you know, behind a fence post, I, you know, grab my spray. <laughs> Just leave what those happens, guys alone. What happens when someone brings in a sample of grass to you or to your master gardeners lately? What do you see in that grass sample? Not much of anything. Usually a fungus called take all root rot, but generally turf samples, when people bring them in, we don't see any ants or earwigs or insects or anything that you would normally find in a healthy lawn. It's kind of um, a post-apocalyptic wasteland. It's terrifying. It yeah. Really is. Yeah, because services do such... Don't worry, guys. If you have a service, they do a fantastic job of killing everything in your lawn. Now, they may not kill if the fungus is killing your lawn, but when it comes to insects and everything else, there's generally it's generally scorched earth. There's nothing alive out there. So if, you, if your lawn is dying, it's not from an insect that you have a ton of because they're not there generally. It's some other reason. Too much water, too little water, a fungus, usually cutting too short. That's the biggest killer of lawns that we see by far. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm wondering now if the fungus isn't taking up a niche, you know, where insects used to be, you know, some living thing, nature abhors a vacuum, <laughs> some living thing wants to exist. So we've wiped out all the actual insects. So now this fungus has room to grow. Mm -hmm. Again, yeah, Heather says people have stopped asking her for advice for getting rid of living things in the yards or if bugs are good or bad because caterpillars turn into butterflies and things eat other things. <laughs> yes. Even if the caterpillar turns into an ugly moth, there are birds that would love to eat that caterpillar. Mm -hmm. So everything out there is important in the whole life cycle. You just need to figure out, number one, what is it? Number two, does how does it fit in? Number three, is it really a pest? Do you really need to do something about it? Or is it the kind of thing that you could just leave it be and it's not going to be a huge issue? Somebody trained Heather very well, Phil. <laughs> yeah, it probably wasn't me, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, guys, if you guys have any lawn and garden type questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat and ask them soon. I have to go in the not-too-distant future because, of course, this being Thursday, and we have our virtual plant clinic at 10 a.m., that's when the computer repair company emails me and says the repair guy is going to be here at about 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. And Teresa had to go to the uh, bank to make a deposit, and she will not be here until around 10 a.m. And everything is suspiciously quiet out there, so I don't know what's happening in the office. My guess is everybody's kind of wandering in, all looking for me because I'm the only one that can solve all their questions and problems and everything else. You know, my computer's broken for like two months, and today's the day they picked to send the guy out to replace well, the part. They can, they can wait. Um, Leslie has a good question. White stuff rotten through Ella. Okay. That's a good question from several different directions here. <laughs> Ruelia, the old-fashioned Mexican petunias, is a really bad invasive plant. The ones with the purple flowers, I guess it's more purple than blue. So the purple flower ones are an invasive plant. We don't recommend growing it. If it has white stuff on it, I need to look at that more closely or get some really, really up-close pictures. Could be something like mealybugs on it. 
but there's a lot of things that white stuff on a leaf could be. So I'm going to show all of our emails at the end here. So Leslie, if you want to write that down, send me some good, clear, as up close pictures as you can get. I could try to narrow down what it could be and probably isn't. My guess is, you know, Ruelias, as a general rule, we have the invasive one, and then we have the newer, newer varieties that are not invasive, supposedly. They're supposed to be sterile. They're supposed to be sterile. Supposed to be sterile. They're still kind of evaluating that, but they gener we can recommend them generally, kind of, sort of. But uh, really, they, rare, they don't have any problems. I've never seen them die from a disease or pests. There's other things that I get questions on all day long, and Ruelius is definitely not one of them. Linda has a question or a statement. Okay, Linda says, I just saw a post about mowing and mulching the leaves in our yard because it kills a lot of insects that are beneficial and maybe cocooning in the leaves. That is correct. And we have just made Facebook posts on that recently, and we probably need to do that again. Don't obsess over mowing, mulching, raking leaves here in Florida. Guys, this is Florida. It's not New York. It's not New Jersey. It's not Pennsylvania. You don't have to go out there and rake your leaves. But even if you leave up no, live up north. Do, they don't want them to do them there either. I see posts coming from there saying not to do that. Exactly. Tons of insects and cocoons over winter. Things that turn into great, big, beautiful moths. So there's a lot. And, and food for birds. So if there's any way you can leave the leaves, leave the leaves. Mm -hmm. And, oh, my God, look at all these questions that popped up all of a sudden here. So Nancy wants to know, can you fertilize a papaya the same as a banana? Yes, you can. Papayas and bananas are, they're not annuals and they're not perennials. They are technically long-lived annuals or short-lived perennials, depending on how you want to look at it. So they, gener they live for generally more than a year. But they don't live for 20 or 30 years because the banana grows, grows, and grows. It makes bananas. You cut the bananas off of it. Then that plant dies, but the new sprouts, you do the same with them. Papayas and bananas are two of the few plants where we recommend give them plenty of water, plenty of fertilizer, lots of compost, lots of fish emulsion, which is a very mild fertilizer. They are little hogs. But if you feed them and water them generously, they will grow like crazy and give you bananas and papayas. With most other plants, we don't tell you to be that generous with fertilizer and water because they really don't need huge amounts of water. They don't need huge amounts of fertilizer. They might need proper specific fertilizer, like palm fertilizer for a palm and citrus fertilizer for a citrus tree. But yeah, for papayas and bananas, pour on the good care Make them grow like crazy, and they'll come up fast and give you bananas or papayas. Although, Nancy, where does Nancy live? Do you I'm thinking she lives around here. I'm not sure. So I was where thinking no. about trees. Because yeah. here, you need to make your papayas to bananas grow really fast so you get food off of them before they freeze. South of here, you don't have to worry about that. But you can still give them plenty of water and plenty of fertilizer. And Heather has a question about okra. Hers had small black lumps on the vegetable part itself. Any idea what it could have been? I can't bring it in now because I pulled the plants. Yeah, okra is one of the few things that you grow during the heat of summer, June, July, and August. It is a tropical vegetable, and it doesn't mind the heat and humidity. Uh, okra, you have to be very, really careful to pick the okra pods when they're small. If you let them go one day too long and they get too big and they if they go from flower to little okra pods very, very quickly in a day or two, if they get too big, they will be tough as like a twig. So picture a twig off a tree trying to cut it, crunch, 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 like saw mm -hmm. through it. So okra gets really tough and woody really, really, really quick. Small black lumps on it might have just been a distortion on the fruit. Okra generally does not have any pest or disease issues except 
root knot nematodes. And if your garden has root knot nematodes, they will eat and kill your okra very, very quickly. You probably won't get okra. So for a lot of people, it's what tells them they have root knot nematodes is when their okra fails quickly and they dig it up and it's just a stick. It looks like this with no roots because all the roots are gone. The nematodes destroyed them very quickly. So small black lumps on the vegetable part was probably not a major issue. Um, it's great that you grow okra. I need to grow some this coming summer. I like okra. Not many people do. It's essential for gumbo. Yeah. Do you notice how this show always turns around to trading recipes? It does, yes. And insect poo also. <laughs> Some kind of poo, yeah. So Leslie says, yeah, she thinks it's a mealy bug. She'll send a picture. A lot of times with mealy bugs, if you have a little bit, just trim it out and take the couple little branches or leaves that they're on and throw them in the trash and get rid of them. Problem solved. And Nancy, oh, Nancy does live in Brooksville, so she lives here. So, Nancy, your papayas and bananas can and probably will get freeze damage this winter, all depending on where you're growing them and how warm you can keep them. And Nancy has 666. That's fine. For, for bananas and um, papayas, 666 is fine. And, ooh, Heather had okra growing in her aquaponics. No, nematodes cannot live in water. Root knot nematodes are a problem in your soil. And there's certain plants that they attack the roots on and damage them badly. Okra, they'll just, they'll, the roots just disappear. Tomatoes and peppers, the plants will die eventually. And when you pull the plants up, You'll see all these big bumps and balls on the roots, and the roots will be really swollen. That's an indication you have root knot nematodes that damage the roots. So when they damage the roots, your plant can't take up water or nutrients and tends to wilt a lot and decline. And no, okra and aquaponics, that's great. If you ever do that again, send me some pictures. I wonder I'll if start throwing your pictures in some of my classes. That's great. I wonder if the black bumps is something to do with the actual aquaponic part of it. That's And it might be a physiological thing, dependent on what variety of okra you're growing, how large and mature the pot is. Uh, Lee loves okra cooked with onions and tomatoes. So do I. You know, in a couple of weeks, and let me check my schedule here. On Thursday, December 9th, for our virtual plant clinic, we are going to have a special guest. I think it's December 9th. Um, Wendy, who is with University of Florida Extension, she is our district family and consumer science agent, is going to be on here to see what StreamYard is like and talk about healthy cooking. So we'll have to start trading all the good okra recipes and everything else then just in time for the holidays exactly and lee grows okra in pots i've done that before too boy i had to water it like twice a day mm -hmm. seemed like I, I was just dumping because it was in a big pot I, I would just fill a five gallon bucket and just dump it on there i could not get enough water on that okra to keep it really happy but they did well in pots And yes, there is my email. And for anybody with really, really difficult questions, send them to this lady right here. You can forward them right back to W. Lester. <laughs> if they're really difficult or if you need an answer really quick, because sometimes Things get shuffled. I always get to the emails eventually. It takes me a while sometimes. But once it gets pushed down that email list, yeah, well, I have to go back to them. I'll sit there every once in a while and just go through all of them and get caught up. But You have another question from another Master Gardener there. Yes, I do. And, Lori, that is a really, really good question. 
I did not buy any because we're heading out of summer and into fall and nematodes are much less problematic in a cooler weather. And what I was going to be growing had fewer nematode problems. But I am going to get some for this spring because I'm planning on tomatoes, peppers, lots of beans, pole beans, and I'm not sure what else I'm going to put in in the spring. What is the stuff? I don't know. I'm going to have to look it up. <laughs> I got kill, uh, it's a nematicide, I assume. There is a product that's made by a company called Monterey, and there's others. I'm sure there's other manufacturers of this. And it is made from uh, the oils and sap from a tropical tree. And it helps to control nematodes. It kills some of them, makes all the other ones very unhappy. It creates a really unpleasant lifestyle for them. And they move away. So you do have to apply it pretty frequently. It's the kind of thing that you would plan on applying more than once. You apply it as a drench, so you water your plants with it. But it does, and I looked up research on it, it's found that it really does decrease the amount of root knot nematodes and the level of damage as opposed to not using it. So it helps, but it's not going to get rid of all of them, and it's not 100% cure-all. And it is made by Monterey. If you look up Monterey nematode control, well, you know, let's see if I can show that. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Well, if you just Google Monterey nematode, that's where it is. It's the very first one, the Monterey Organic Concentrate Nematode Control. So that, I can't say that it works for sure because I've never tried it, but I'm going to get it this coming spring before I put my crops in because I know I'm going to have to use it on the tomatoes, tomatoes for sure, and probably beans also. So I'll give it a try and see how well it works. Uh-oh. Japanese sunflowers. Lily, are you familiar with them? No. <laughs> I'm not. Neither, neither am I. <laughs> Mexican sunflowers, yes. Um, that's the problem with common names. I'm not sure what they are to answer one way or the other. Um, there's what they call those crazy daisies um, that... You know, bloom profusely and have big tall bushes of sunflowers, also called Mexican sunflowers. I think those are on the invasive list. I'm not sure what Japanese sunflowers are. You can email one of us and we can look it up and get back to you on that. Or yeah, you if you can send one of us either a picture, a uh, scientific name. There are a ton of different types of sunflowers. You know what's blooming and, great right now? What native sunflower, a narrow leaf sunflower, also called a swamp sunflower, which is interesting because I've got it growing like crazy in my, you know, very dry yard. <clears throat> they love this time of year and they're blooming like, and they're small. Sunflowers, but they bloom profusely. And they have kind of like three foot tall stalks with very narrow leaves. And a lot of them. And, and before they start blooming, it looks like a bunch of cousin hits are coming up <laughs> in your garden. And my husband um, texted me one of the last times we had a good rain. He said, Your sunflowers are blinding me. They're so yellow. <laughs> No. 
Yes. I found Swamp Sunflower, and I believe that's the one you were just talking about. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Helianthus and Gustafolius, okay. and that's a native that's in Florida. Beautiful. beautiful, beautiful. I'll bring a picture for the next time we meet. Okay. Which will not be next week. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Next week, yeah. Hey, everybody. Next Thursday is Thanksgiving. I don't think we're gonna be here. Yes. I'm not gonna be here, so I will later on today make a Facebook event and a little uh, wishing everybody a very happy and safe Thanksgiving. And we will be here the following Thursday, but we will not be here next Thursday. Okay. Um, and. Mexican sunflower. I believe it is, but I don't want to say for absolute sure. So go ahead and email one of us and we can look it up. Um, yeah. And also there's severities of invasiveness too. There's ones that, you know, they put different classifications. We don't recommend utilizing any invasive plants if you can help it. Because they're just going to get worse, <laughs> you know. But um, oh, people love them because they're beautiful. We've done classes on invasive species before. I have one called seductive invaders. Nobody said they're not beautiful. That is, that's not the point. Aren't Mexican sunflowers the Tithonia? It's an annual. It's a small. I know that there's a small. Mexican sunflower, and then there's the one that gets huge, like it can get 10 feet tall. Yeah, they call those the crazy daisies. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think either one is invasive in Central Florida. Might be different for South Florida. Um, yeah, if you want to shoot one of us an email with some more information, we can look it up. Sure. And Lily, what other native flowers are good for this time of year in nine feet past? Hmm? Climbing asters blooming like crazy little uh, purpley, light purple flowers. Um, those bloom like crazy. Um, it's a favorite of the gentleman who, until very recently, had my job in Pasco County, um, Frank. He loves <coughs> those flowers. He swears they smell like sugar cookies. <laughs> so it kind of puts him in a holiday mood. Oh, what else is, I mean, a lot of things that continue to bloom all year are going to bloom really till first frost, such as beach sunflower. That's a Mexican. Oh, that's a Mexican. I'm reading Mexican. <laughs> that's a native. A native um, ground cover, more or less. The salvias are still blooming. Um, what do you got blooming out in your native garden out front there? <laughs> You walked by it, didn't you? Goldenrod. No, the, the goldenrod mm -hmm. is still in full bloom, and that's a late bloomer. Uh-huh. Um, salt bush that I, I would assume yeah. you're not going to have salt bush unless you have a very large garden. You're out in the country or whatever. It, it, it is a pretty big plant. Uh -huh. It's kind of one of the last things to bloom in the fall. Um, what other natives? And the galardia is going down. It's done. Wow. Yeah. Um, Our dune sunflower here is pretty much done. Oh, mine's still the strong. It, it'll go. It'll be there till it freezes. Yeah, and they look ugly, and I'll cut it back, and it'll come back. What is really going down, of course, is the um, Biden's alba. Finally, <laughs> so it's time to clean that out. <laughs> um, and yes, I was thinking Tithonia is a type of Mexican sunflower that's more of a like border annual. It's a small, small plant, gets a lot of flowers. And then you have the other one that's called Mexican sunflower that becomes really, really large, the crazy hats or crazy daisies or whatever, yeah, gets a really yeah. large flower. Lee has senna growing in South Florida. Yes, and that's been blooming at our nursery. That's Black eyed Susan vine still going, and she's not a native, but yes. Snow square stem, which we have growing here at the office that I had never really seen before, is huge, and it's oh, flowering. Oh, it's oh, beautiful. Scorpion. 
scorpion plant is blooming right now too speaking yeah the little scorpion tail but that that blooms almost all the time except right. i'm sure it freezes if it's trying to take over my front bed i was like no go for it go right ahead i cleared out that biden's alba which i know will still keep trying to come back i put in some baby coonty there so it has plenty of time to grow because it grows real slow and i don't think the biden's alba will prohibit it really from growing and of course you know i wait till this time of year to clean it out and so i get the the stuff <laughs> the little sticker things all over me when i'm doing that. yeah 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 Okay, any last minute questions? Muley grass. Muley grass is blooming right now, too. Yes. Yeah. Um, what we had at the nursery is blooming, and I've noticed it everywhere I drive around town. Mm -hmm. It's being used quite a bit, even with um, commercial businesses in their yeah. landscaping, which is nice yeah. to see. Yep. It, I swear, um, Muley grass, Kunti. And Yopon Holly are probably the easiest um, formal landscape friendly native plants <laughs> to find. Mm -hmm. And there is the phone number for the office. If you call, Teresa may be here to answer the phone. <laughs> like I said, I'm not sure what's going on out. It's awfully quiet out there. It's like when the kids get too quiet. It's like, there's something going on out there. I just don't know what. You know. Maybe they're on their computers enraptured with this program. I'll go out there and we'll have a technician. has got my computer all taken apart. <laughs> Bernie will be back there with a the soldering iron helping them. That's right. You've got Bernie today. What are you worried about? <laughs> yeah, Bernie can pitch in and help them. Uh-huh. And if anybody's interested in any other classes or events what we have coming up, just visit www.hernandoextensionalloneword.com, and it has a full listing of all of our upcoming classes, where they're going to be, whether it's Facebook, Zoom, YouTube, here, there, wherever, all the links, all the registration information, if registration is required the links to just log on if you happen to be free that time of day to go ahead and log on everything you need to know is right there and remember we will not be back next thursday because that's thanksgiving happy thanksgiving everyone mm -hmm. but we will be back the week after that so um until then anything else Lily? Um, Firebush is still blooming. <laughs> I'm still on that. <laughs> You're still sitting there. That's still churning through. What else is still blooming? Firebush blooms. Unless you get a hard freeze, firebush will bloom all year long. Yep. Oh, if you, speaking of blooming. <laughs> yes, yes. You happen to have the non native um, Asclepius cursivaca. Um, which is tropical milkweed, the orange and yellow multi uh, colored flowers. Cut it back now because you don't want that blooming. It doesn't know to go down like our native milkweeds do. And what could happen, unless you're in South Florida, I'm speaking to the Central and North Florida people now, um, it could continue blooming and then you were kind of continue attracting the monarchs and they may be stuck here in a freeze and free, <clears throat> freeze to death. If you want to encourage them down to go see Lee <laughs> in South Florida. So if you happen to have that, cut it back and keep it cut back until um, mid-March. Okay, guys. Well, it looks like it's just about that time. And like I said, I need to go find out what's going on out there. So, <laughs> so hey, everyone, have a great, fun, thankful, and safe Thanksgiving. And we will see you again, not next Thursday, but the following Thursday. They're going to be too busy cooking and eating next Thursday. Don't worry about Exactly. That. I know I will be. Yes. So until then, everybody take care. And thank you so much for tuning in again.
All righty, we'll see you.